Uh, let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, what I want to talk about today is how we are able to actually change our patients' lives that are dealing with the mold toxicity and the brain injuries. And this is something where every, every one of the speakers today is going to bring in a lot of valuable information and valuable tools on how to deal with individual parts of the problems here. One of the big things that we're going to be looking at is how can we uh, actually make this change to where we are able to take that patient from step A all the way to step Z and help them to become happy, healthy, vibrant people again who have had their lives basically taken away from them. Uh, there's many different reasons why we will get brain injuries and that's one of the, the big things that we're going to be talking about here in a few minutes. Uh, my name again is Dr. Ben Galliard. I practice full-time in Fort Collins, Colorado. I have done functional medicine, functional neurology, neurofeedback, many types of, of practice for a long time here. This is going on my 15th year. Uh, I have three neurofeedback machines running at this time, different clear mind systems. Uh, we use the focus unit, the home unit with patients as well. We're getting ready to set up a satellite clinic in the next town over where we will be able to help patients that aren't able to, to get all the way up to our practice twice a week. We'll, they'll be able to, to go to that satellite clinic where we'll have another neurofeedback system going. Uh, I'm constantly on the lookout for new equipment, new ways of helping people, and that's what I want to give you some of these tools today is what's really working in my practice, what's working in other, other docs practices that I know, and the doctors that I'm, I'm coaching on these techniques as well. So uh, I'll go ahead and jump right in. Uh, the, when we start thinking about how are we going to truly change this patient's life, we have to start with that one question. And whether I'm doing a workshop, I'm doing a consultation with a patient, anything along those lines, I start with why is this actually happening and why, why have you not gotten the changes? Why is your body malfunctioning? All those things. And so what we look at is how can we, how can we take that why, get the answers, and go into actually treating and successfully helping this patient heal. Uh, one of the things I want to get started with today is a video uh, that, let me see if I can bring this one up here, that a patient sent over. And if you guys can go ahead and watch this. It's going to be a little loud here. Let me turn that down. This is a, a four-year-old patient, and she came to my practice about three or four months ago. Uh, major neurological issues. She's four years old, was about a nine-month-old. Been to every neurologist out there. They could not come up with uh, a specific diagnosis of what was going on. She went through the, the whole gamut, all the tests, genetic tests, everything possible. She had major neurological deficits, and uh, neurological degeneration, but no one could figure out what was actually going on, and there was no, not even a diagnosis named on there. Uh, when I'll give you the uh, go. This is uh, from the from the patient's mother. Uh, Hello, Dr. Galliard. Thank you again for everything. What you and your staff have done for us over the past two months is more than anyone else over the past three and a half years. Bell only tried the parallel bars once before the previous week and did well, but needed hands-on contact. Last Thursday, she didn't. The video was her third time doing the exercise because the first time we were in shock. The second time we were crying because Bell infrequently does things twice in a row. And the third time, what I recorded, was her being like, you guys want me to do this again? Okay, because I can do this. Thank you again for helping our child grow and listening to us. So when we start thinking about uh, brain injuries, when we start thinking about uh, any type of neurodegeneration in the brain, this is one example of it. Usually we think about a 2 by 4 upside the head or an NFL player, things like that, but just like Dr. Suter was talking about earlier, we have many different things that can cause neurodegeneration in the brain. 
and for this little four-year-old patient uh, there was many many factors that went into it and and some of the the thoughts are from the vaccinations the mother had from the heavy metal toxicity from uh, the blood-brain barrier issues a lot of different things had come up that had led to where she was. So what have we done for her? Well, we started out by oxygenating her body. We started out by training her brain with the neurofeedback. We started uh, with the pulse magnetic field generator to get her cells activating different. And she went from not even being able to stand to on Tuesday, her mom and I held on to her hands and she walked all the way across our, our uh, front waiting room. And that was before three months ago, she had never walked like that before. So this is what, I, what we look at every day is how can we help these patients to truly start healing, whether uh, when we look, look at the, the slide here, brain injuries can come from many different forms. So we can have impacts. So that's the traditional ones that we think about brain injury and concussions. We think about uh, a brick dropping down three stories. We think about soccer. I've had many, many female soccer players that they they ru run up to each other and try to head the ball and hit each other. They've fallen on the ground and hit hit their head, had full blown seizures. Many different issues can come from from those impact injuries, and that's the main one that we think about. Going your head through the through the uh, dash in the in the or windshield in the car on a motor vehicle accident. Any of these different different damages can cause that coup counter coup that we're going to get more into in the in later in today's seminar. Uh, but really what we look at is there's a lot of other issues that can lead to the damage to the brain. So one of the big ones that we look at is the blood sugar. A lot of people don't realize that they're calling Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes. And the reason is because when that blood sugar gets elevated for too long and that insulin response kicks in, we get a uh, inflammatory cascade that causes neurological damage and causes neurological degeneration. In 2005, there was a study produced by the Journal of Neurology. Uh, it was uh, reported that they found a significant correlation between hemoglobin A1C and the amount of brain loss that people had in a year-over-year -year time period. Uh, upwards of, if someone's in that diabetic range, they lost twice as much brain as the people in the 5.2 and below on the A1C. But even the people in the 5.3 to 5.5 range on the hemoglobin A1C, they still lost 50% more more brain than that lowest group. So even a slightly elevated blood sugar can cause significant neurodegeneration. And it makes sense when you think about neuropathy and the damage to the eyes and all the different things that happens from blood sugar and, and diabetes. It, it's not a far stretch to think that, well, of course, the brain is, is all almost all nerves. Of course, there's going to be damage when we get that inflammation in there. So blood sugar is very, very important. If somebody has, has the predisposition for not healing their brain as well, they have to figure out what their blood sugar is. Uh, we look at the, at the mold, which we're going to get very in-depth into today. And Dr. Suter just went over with his slide presentation. There are some significant changes that take place in the brain when we are exposed to mold, especially when people have the, the right type of genetics for that to take place. Uh, PTSD. There is a lot of research showing that uh, there is neurodegeneration that takes place year after year after someone has had PTSD, some type of trauma, whether that's full on went over to war and dealt with it or just dealt with, with a dad that was volatile and violent and would come home drunk or whatever else, those are the people that are going to have, uh, just like Dr. Suter said, the anxiety and that rev up and the damage to the hippocampus and everything else that, that down regulates from that place. So those, those traumatic events need to be processed, one with counseling and things like that, but then also with the brain training that we can do where we can actually teach the brain to not go to that extreme state. Uh, heavy metals, again the mercury, aluminum, all the different different metals out there in different environmental uh, traumas can have a major effect on our brain. Stroke, seizures, migraines, any of the uh, biochemical and leading to biomechanical changes in the brain that we start 
uh, from the inside out can have serious damage to the brain as well. So these are some of the basic things that I start looking at when a patient comes in and I start thinking, okay, what is the condition of their brain? Have they had any of these exposures, any of these traumas, any of these different things? Uh, if, they, if they have, then we know we've got to get much more in depth and we've got to do the brain, brain map, the quantitative EEG, we've got to do the APOE test, we've got to do all these other, other things. So again, each one of these can cause some very serious neurodegeneration into the brain and from there we'll get symptoms of many different kinds and so uh, one of one of the, the interesting research studies I was just looking at they were showing that if someone had a traumatic brain injury which is upwards of 1.7 million people a year have traumatic brain injuries they were showing that uh, upwards of 30 percent of those have major endocrine disruption especially thyroid after that so what's the What's the, the why there? Well, then we start looking at it can cause damage to the blood-brain barrier, it can cause damage to the gut lining and cause an inflammatory immune cascade. When you look at over 80% of low thyroid is actually autoimmune, Hashimoto's to the thyroid, it's not a far stretch to think, well, if we have gut lining issues, if we have the microbiome uh, dysregulated, that can stimulate that autoimmunity and start damaging parts of the brain. So uh, having a, a much better idea of what your patient's history was as far as potential brain injuries, go back on that initial evaluation and ask them uh, about any, any head injuries at all, anything falling off the monkey bars, getting in a car accident. Most people, what are they going to tell you if they've been in a car accident under 50 miles an hour? Oh, it wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, it was just a we, we just tapped. I walked away. Well, if you look at any of the any of the videos or pictures of what the brain actually does inside of the skull upon impact, it's very traumatic and causes uh, a lot of the shearing of the axons and many many different things that come come into play that cause the damage to that brain. So, uh, as far as the amount of uh, of work that we have to put into the diagnosis this is this is really where we get all of that information that we need to move forward with how are we actually going to treat this brain how are we going to get this person improving so well one of the first things that I do in practice when I think about how am I going to figure out where the damage is in the brain what type of of damage has occurred and is this person going to be repairing as well as they should the brain map the quantitative EEG is one of the first places that I start uh, if a patient comes in and they uh, most of my patients come in for some type of an emotional issue whether that's uh, anxiety stress depression bipolar anything like that they can't sleep maybe they've got a digestion issue they've got slow slow bowel movements they've got constipation things like that uh, if there's a brain component to what they're coming in for, I do a brain map with them. I want to know, is this more of a brain-based issue? Is this more of a metabolic issue? And a lot of times it's both. And most of them like to like to figure that out as well, and they're happy to, to jump in and do the brain map. So we'll include the brain map with most of our new patient visits. And from there, we're able to see specifically what is going on with that brain. Much of the time, if it's a if it's a new brain injury, so if they've been in a car accident, I had a patient in February. She runs a supplement company. She fell on the ice, hit her head, uh, and we mapped her in the first probably three weeks. And we actually had quite a bit of high. So uh, we on the brain map, we can tell is it one or two standard deviations higher or lower than the normative database which is over 150,000 brains now so if it's in that initial stage of damage a lot of times I will see it as uh, inflammatory meaning that there's more electrical activity there's more inflammation the body's trying to heal that specific area uh, in the next we didn't start brain training for about two and a half to three months with her as we let the body start healing a little bit started oxygen therapy supplementation our brain repair kit many different things to help her uh, start 
start recuperating so that we could get to that point of healing healing the body with the with the brain training uh, we but we don't start right off the bat with that so as we remapped her at that two and a half month point there was actually a lot more blues which is indicative of more of a one and two standard deviation lower than what we what we want it to be so as those neurons started to die and down regulate we produced less electrical activity and so it wasn't wasn't a far stretch to find those areas in the in the map where there was some significant change and significant decrease in electrical activity and make that assumption that that was where a lot of the the damage was taking place so uh, we'll we'll do the brain map great way to get that baseline get a feel for where the damage is and to what extent and as we do treatment we're going to be able to tell is someone actually uh, repairing are we seeing the changes with the the map itself great way it has the dashboard that says what percentage someone's healing and it's a very nice way to be able to tell for us as well as for the patient okay you're feeling way better so that patient that fell and hit her head in February uh, she had gone through had done done some different things leading up until we started the the neurofeedback she was still wearing sunglasses even even three months into the process uh, because of of the light sensitivity that she was having after we started our oxygen therapy for a week or two and two or three weeks into the neurofeedback no more sunglasses uh, she was just at a at a brain workshop I was teaching on Tuesday night she got up did a testimonial I didn't even know she was coming but she wanted to get up and speak to everyone she started crying uh, just saying how profoundly uh, changed her life was now that she was able to to make these these differences so the brain map is really where we start with that that process uh, the APOE which uh, Kurt is going to be speaking about from uh, from the genetic perspective, the APOE is our way of being able to tell if someone's a carrier with the APOE4 gene, so whether they're a 3-4 or a 4-4, we know that that brain is not going to repair as well as it should. So what does that tell me diagnostically? That tells me that I'm going to need to do more glutathione, I'm going to need to do more anti-inflammatories and resveratrol and all the different nutrients that we know that are very helpful, and I know that I'm going to need to do more neurofeedback sessions as well and so that I should probably do some extra oxygen and we should do some vibration plate and some magnetic field generator and all the other tools that we have if someone is an E4 carrier it just dials me in so much more for the patient it's very helpful diagnostically because they're able to see it and say holy cow this is what the research shows that if someone has the E4 gene and they get a concussion they're 10 times more likely to get Alzheimer's well that's pretty motivating for somebody to say you know what I'm gonna keep my blood sugar stable as possible I'm gonna make sure that I'm getting my exercise and doing uh, uh, all the different things that I need to be doing, showing up to my appointments when I need to. It's a very motiv motivating thing. I have an E4 gene myself. I've had multiple brain injuries as a, as a kid. <clears throat> so, you know, it, I, I can tell you from a personal perspective, it is very motivating. And I, I sit there and think, okay, well, how many times this week should I do, uh, do my neurofeedback? And, uh, oh, I didn't take my glutathione, even though I'm getting the kids ready for bed. I run out and take it because I know that if I don't, down the road, there's going to be some serious deficits that are going to be a lot harder to overcome. Uh, neurological testing. One of the, the great fields uh, that, is, that is exploding at this point is the field of functional neurology. Traditional neurology uh, has had its place for a, a long time with, with diagnostic tests and diagnostic uh, imagery and, and doing a lot of different tools that have, have made great strides on the neurological side. The functional neurology side is taking that to a more uh, changing the patient specifically to where their imbalances are. We can find which parts of the brain are having the most efficiency, not just off of MRI, not just off of a brain map, but off of a functional perspective. Can they, uh, can they touch their fingers to their nose? Do their eyes track on an OPK tape? Do they have a balance issue? Can they do ataxia gait or do they have an ataxia gait? And where is that coming from? Is it a cerebellar problem? All these different things we're able 
able to tell now with the neurological testing uh, from this, this functional neurological perspective. And then we can give exercises specifically to help starting to repair those. And that can be as easy as we have a left brain deficiency and we're going to give right brain or right sided body exercises for that left brain issue. So uh, if you haven't looked into functional neurology yet, I highly encourage you to, especially if you're going to be dealing with brain injuries, if you're going to be dealing with, with mold, toxicities, anything that's damaging and affecting the brain, you, you'll be amazed at the things that you find when you start testing patients in this way, but then also the things that you can do to actually help them. Uh, and then specific questionnaires. I have one uh, that was uh, made up by Dr. Karazian, uh, Datis Karazian, and Dr. Brandon Brock, uh, very specific to the different parts of the brain. Uh, if you would like a copy of that, I can get you my, uh, my email at the end of this and you guys can, can start using that as well. But it's a, a couple pages and very specific to the different regions of the brain, the temporal lobe, the different parts of the frontal lobe, the cerebellum. And so you can match that up with what you're seeing in the brain map, with what you're seeing on your neurological testing. And it really helps dial that, that uh, injury, especially the injury part, into where is that specific injury and what can we do to help help it improve and go from there. So uh, the diagnosis of the brain injury is going to be uh, almost as important as the treatment because if we don't get it right, if we're not treating the right areas, if we're not doing using the right protocol with the neurofeedback, we're not going to get the results and we might as well not even be doing the work. So the diagnosis is very, very important. Uh, so treatment of the brain injuries, this is where we get into the the whole idea of how can we actually repair that brain and repair that damaged area. So the, the little girl I showed you the video of, uh, we came in and we have been doing some very specific things with her. So neurofeedback is, is one of the core things that we have been doing. So uh, we at first we were able to get about five or ten minutes for the first couple sessions with her. She could sit there, her mom would have to kind of hold her down a little bit, but she could watch the screen, she could see it coming in and out, she was able to hear the sound coming out, it started turning that brain back on. We're up to over 20 minutes now with those sessions. She's able to sit there. She holds on to her mom's uh, hand. She'll grab her mom and try to show her something in the screen where three months ago she was just glazed and looking out at the at the, the side of the room, really had no idea what else was going on. Now she's interacting. She's starting to uh, she'll actually get mad at her older brother, which mom, at first mom was kind of like, oh my gosh, who's this cranky kid? Now she'll actually get mad. She'll get uh, feelings of, of uh, wanting a, a toy that the brother's playing with, and she'll grab it from him, things like that, where before she wasn't even aware of what was going on around her. Uh, my staff had a, had a pretty interesting way to, to describe it the other day. They said she was looking at things like they were the most beautiful shirt or flower or whatever in the world, like the first time she'd ever seen it, like the colors were just turning on in her brain. And so uh, the neurofeedback has been a great avenue for us to be able to start teaching these damaged brains how to come back on. Uh, the brain repair kit, this is, is one of the, the tools from from CitraSafe that we give every one of our, our brain injury patients that we start with. Uh, we've got a acetylated glutathione that is is the the best glutathione in the field that that I've been able to find. Uh, it is able to make dramatic changes. I've got a patient with MS. We started using uh, 900 milligrams a day, and within a month, he was moving his legs again for the first time in a year. Pretty pretty profound changes. Uh, we've got the a balm with in olive oil and coconut oil, and it has that acetylated uh, glutathione in there as well. We'll rub that on the specific area. So someone with a brain injury will rub into the temples, will rub into the carotids, uh, into any other areas of, of injury. The pine bark extract is going to uh, increase the nitric oxide. We'll take that directly with the, the glutathione, and that is going to uh, help increase the glutathione uptake and the 
the usage of the glutathione, and then we have the, the sublingual resveratrol, which again uh, has a much more dramatic effect on the inflammation, on the brain, on the repair. Everything we can we can do through that process with, with sublingual is going to be much, much greater than uh, taking a supplement, or some of you may even drink a, drink a glass of wine for your resveratrol, but that's probably not going to be the, the best way to get it in. Uh, so one of the other tools that has really had a profound effect in the last uh, last few months that we've been using it since we brought it on is called LiveO2. Uh, it's www.liveo2.com if you want to look that up. A uh, wonderful company and uh, we can help you get set up in that process if, if you're looking to start incorporating some oxygen therapy. Uh, at first we were using hyperbaric and hyperbaric has some really nice nice attributes to it, uh, can do some great things for patients. Our, our drawbacks were it was going to take an entire uh, separate technician uh, from for me to employ to run it. Uh, it was uh, over an hour per session, hour and 15, hour and 30 minutes. They couldn't wear socks because it might get static electricity and blow up. A bunch of different things could happen in there. Uh, and so we, we were also limited by the number that we could do. So uh, we could all, if we're seeing neurofeedback-wise a patient every 15 minutes in our office, uh, we could only do the hyperbaric on one out of four or five patients, so it just wasn't uh, wasn't effective in our in our office. So we went with the LiveO2 system. LiveO2 is an exercise with oxygen therapy. So we have a mask. It's running straight uh, to the to a large uh, bag filled with oxygen. We get 80% oxygen coming into the body, and it's a very profound. Even within seconds, people's pulse ox will go up. One of my patients, uh, even with oxygen, walking around all day, she's in the 93 to 94 pulse ox range. Within 20 seconds of going on to the 80% oxygen, her pulse ox is up to 99. Uh, we'll we'll. For some patients, we'll do just a basic, here, let's uh, pedal on the bike, five, ten minutes, just getting oxygen into the body, it's trying to hyperoxygenate the brain, the heart, the main, main systems that need it. Uh, for some patients, we'll do a deprivation, especially when they, when they get used to the system, when they get, get feeling better. So with that patient that had the, the oxygen that she usually was using, uh, we did two rounds of deprivation for her. So we would take her, uh, deprive oxygen, basically take her up to 15,000 foot elevation for about 15 seconds while she's sprinting on the bike. And then we would supersaturate with uh, the 80% oxygen, go into, into that sprint stage still, and then let her heart rate calm down to about 100. And we did that twice. By the end of that first session, her fingers were tingling, her toes were tingling. She was getting oxygen to the tissues where she rarely ever, ever gets it, even being on oxygen full time using a CPAP at night. Uh, all these different tools. So what, what does that do? Well, the brain needs two things to function optimally. It needs activation, which is part of that functional neurology piece, and it needs fuel. Fuel comes in the form of oxygen and glucose. So glucose, we'll talk about in here in a second, looking at the blood work, but oxygen, what we look at is we've got to get oxygenation to the brain. So you've got to make sure that your patient is not anemic, you've got to make sure that your patient has proper blood sugar. Uh, so if those are fine, great, let's move on. Let's do that live O2. We've got to get oxygen to the tissues, especially when we're doing the exercise with oxygen. It's going to drive it into the different tissues, especially the distal tissue. And the brain is a distal tissue. So oxygen will pump up into the brain better. So when her fingers and toes were tingling, her brain was also tingling. She was also uh, regenerating cells. She was bringing oxygen, she was bringing nutrients to that area, to those damaged areas that needed it. So when we deprive, it takes that oxygen away for a little bit, and then when we supersaturate, it's going to drive it in, and the body has a hierarchy of where that oxygen is going to go. So the spleen is going to be one of the last places that we need oxygen, but the brain is going to be one of the first places that needs oxygen, so it's going to drive it there even in a supersaturated format. So the LIBO2, I can't tell you how, how much that, that has changed our patients, especially the brain injury patients. Uh, it, it just has become very profound what we've been able to do with that. 
Uh, the blood work is going to be the next step that we're going to look at. Blood work, we're going to look at many different uh, parts in there. We're going to look at, again, what is the hemoglobin A1C? What is the glucose? Are there any anemias going on? Whether that's the hemoglobin, uh, the red blood cells, any of those different things. So we've got to make sure that all those those nutrients for the brain are working as well as they should. You've got to look at your vitamin D, some of those basic things. But uh, you know, a lot of times with my specific brain injury neurofeedback patients, I don't do a complete functional medicine workup on them, just more of the brain specific things in the blood work. But if we have inflammation, if we have thyroid, if we have adrenals, blood sugar, all those different things, that's all going to affect and cause more damage to the brain. On the functional neurology side, uh, again, if you haven't looked into that yet, highly encourage you to. There's multiple organizations out there that do some really good work. Uh, you can uh, private message me and I'll, I'll go over some of those different ones with you. But the functional neurology is another great piece where we're able to start st stimulating that patient's brain outside in the real world, give them tools to start doing it at home as well. Uh, one of our patients, she's 29. She was uh, had a closed head injury about a year ago. Mom and dad brought her in about you know, four months ago, and she was literally chewing on her finger, just staring off at the wall. I was going over the brain map with mom and dad in, in this same room. I was looking at them, and they kept doing this, this head thing saying, you know, talk to her, and I'd look over and talk to her, and she'd be chewing on her finger and not even looking at me. Uh, so we started doing, doing neurofeedback. We started doing the oxygen work, uh, got her up to 600 milligrams of, of glutathione, and did a APOE test, found that she was... Uh, she was an E4 carrier, so we knew that we were going to have to do more work. And uh, she's to the point now, I think we're 26 or 27 sessions in neurofeedback. Uh, she's started a job working with, uh, with, a, uh, with disabled children. She's registered for three classes. She's going back to college uh, this fall, starting in one week, I think. Uh, and she calls, makes her own appointments. Uh, this one's pretty f profound. She was, uh, her mother was talking to her grandmother on the phone, and the grandmother asked to talk to, to the granddaughter, and so, and to the 29-year-old, and so the mom said, okay, hold on, went and got her. She got on the phone. Two times the grandmother had to ask, hey, uh, get, get Krista on the phone. Wait, I, I want to talk to her. She did not recognize her granddaughter's voice because she was so fluent, she was working, her brain was so wor working so well, things were just dramatically improving there. So uh, when we start treating the brain injuries, we've got story after story after story like this. We had a uh, gentleman in the office the other day, uh, he was a supplement rep for one of the companies we use, and we were talking about neurofeedback and especially the brain injuries, and he said, what's your success rate on, on this? And my staff and I were going through and just patient by patient by patient and uh, every single one that we've done for brain injuries has had a dramatic dramatic change and in my world uh, for them to become more more functional more effective at their job get a job back uh, be able to move out on their own whatever it is they've been able to do it and I consider that a success so treatment of the brain injuries uh, we've got to start with the diagnosis. We've got to start with a good diagnosis, one where we're going to cover all of our bases, know uh, if that brain's going to repair with the APOE, know what the, what the map looks like with the quantitative EEG, look at the other tools, and then we get into the treatment, and we're going to train that brain. We're going to give it the right nutrients. We're going to uh, go through the whole process to figure out what we need to do to to keep them improving and, and reevaluate, and if it doesn't change as much as we should, then we need to change it and move on from there. So uh, the, uh, the brain injuries is a huge part of my practice. It's something, especially like I was saying, 1.7 million traumatic brain injuries a year, it's dramatic, and that's, that's the ones that they're recording from an actual head injury. There's all these other areas. If you've got any niches that you, that you like to get into, Lyme or mold or uh, traumatic stress or any of these different things, there's a brain injury component to it. I 100% guarantee you, if you're not brain mapping, you've got to you've got to get into the brain mapping part as well as the APOE. So the the next step that I want to go over, and this is uh, again a big part of what what multiple present 
commentators are going to be speaking about this uh, the rest of the day, and this is going to be the mold patient. So for a mold patient, there's some very specific things that, that I look for uh, when we start start thinking about how, how in depth do we need to get into the testing part of it. Uh, for me, I get a lot of people's failures. So what I look for is the patient that has been everywhere. They've been told they've got Lyme, Candida, Epstein-Barr, they have autoimmune conditions, they've got, it's a thyroid issue, they've got Hashimoto's, they've, they're dealing with food allergies or gluten or leaky gut or all these different things and they're still not as as healthy as they should be. That's one of the main main times I say, okay, well let's check for mold. Uh, obviously if somebody comes in and they have the traditional mold symptoms, we're going to go ahead and, and test that right off the bat. But especially living in Colorado, most people don't even think that there, there could be a mold issue. So uh, if, if you've got any patients at all that you've been stumped on, this is going to be one of the best places to get started. And uh, if you've got a patient that comes in with traditional mold symptoms, start right off the bat like I'm going to be talking about how we're going to be able to, to do the diagnosis for the mold, how we're going to be able to, to figure this out. So uh, a couple things that, that we'll start with when we start thinking about diagnosing for the mold. Uh, one of the easiest and best ways that we can do this is to use a mold plate. Uh, JW is going to be speaking about how Emulytics is able to, to test these, but it's a very simple process. I carry the plates in my office. Uh, they're only a few dollars a piece. We'll uh, sell them to the patients. We'll have them test the different rooms. So for us, we'll, we'll say any place in the house that's had, had any type of water damage. Uh, do you have carpet in your bedroom? Is there uh, a sump pump is a laundry room, anything at all that may have some, some moisture, some water damage, some potential carpet is really bad that uh, every time you walk on it that the mold spores can get, get uh, kicked up into the environment. So we'll put those mold plates out. There's a specific way to do that. Not complicated at all. Seal them up. Within three days, if there's more than five spores, we'll go ahead and send that off to the lab. And Emulytics does a wonderful job of figuring out exactly what every one of those plates does. When we first found out that our house had, had mold issues, uh, we, we went through and we're like, well, you know, what, what are they really going to test for? And, and the lab kind of chuckled and they said, well, we're going to test for everything. We check every single thing on there. It doesn't matter you know, whether it's in their box of what's what's located in that area of the country or anything else, they test every single thing on that plate. Our house came back uh, probably one of the, the worst they've ever seen. Um, we, we dealt with a lot of things but still ended up deciding uh, on moving and, and there was some dramatic changes in, in my family's health as we did that. So the mold plates were one of the first places that we went to figure out uh, did that work. We just did one. I have a, a older older classic vehicle and I just ran a plate yesterday on that to see uh, if there's any mold coming through the vents or anything else. So we'll, it's a very easy way you can check your animals, you can check your moving into a house, you can do a swipe. Lots of different ways that you can go about, about doing that. Uh, another tool that we use is, is the actual inspection and uh, Jeff uh, book out. He'll be speaking here soon. Uh, we just put an offer in on a house a couple weeks ago. Jeff came out, he inspected the house found water damage throughout the house, a lot of different issues, and uh, we, we were very, very concerned with, uh, with what he found. And we were able to say, okay, uh, to the seller, we have this, 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 and this issue going on, the humidity is too high, we've had previous water damage, all those different things are going to be, uh, to be seen in that inspection, and uh, we ended up not not taking the house, even though it was a beautiful property. We really enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, the uh, all of those were really good. And I'm gonna someone raised their hand. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, the the inspection is going to be a very very crucial part for a lot of people's uh, houses or apartments or whatever it is. If you can't get a hold of Jeff in your area or if you don't have somebody that can come look at it, you can do a lot of that yourself and, and he could walk you through that process as well. Uh, the brain map, just like Dr. Suter was talking about, we have some very good ways to be able to uh, figure out what the uh, what the uh, what damage has taken place to the brain? Is it inflamed? 
all those all those different things. Um, let me. There's a couple questions here. I'll go ahead and grab these and then get back to it. Uh, who does APOE testing in Georgia area? How is it done through blood work? Uh, so great. Uh, the APOE testing. Uh, Kurt is going to speak about that in a minute. And then what is the address for the mold plates? Uh, uh, JW will be speaking about that as well. So uh, don't worry, all of these different things I'm talking about, uh, either the different presenters will be will be covering. If not, uh, I'll go ahead and and answer those questions as we go along. But uh, I'm I'm kind of putting it all together before everyone else speaks, and so we're gonna we're gonna jump ahead with some of these concepts that you're not really fully aware of yet but you're going to be well versed on and then any other information you need will get to you through that process. So uh, the brain map again is going to be a, the quantitative EEG. It's going to be the best way that we have in office, very reasonable, very easy to do, it takes about 15 minutes. Uh, my staff is set up, uh, I have one, one lady that does almost all of my maps, she is just super fast with it, six minutes eyes open, six minutes eyes closed, in and out we get a great amount of information and we charge about $90 for the brain map I included in my new patient visit so it's a very simple process, very reasonable and we get a lot of good information out of there. The APOE test, this is a uh, it's a, a buccal membrane test, and Kurt will be speaking about this. We're able to do a swab. We're able to tell, does someone have that E4 gene or not? If they do, we know that the brain is not going to repair as well as it should. So all those potential damages to the brain, if someone is an E4 and they've had those, those damages to the brain, they're not going to heal as well as they should. So that's when we've got to figure out uh, if... If they do, well, what can we do to repair and what can we do to stop the damage because we know it's not going to repair if there is more damage. And then again, uh, any of the neurological testing uh, for any brain injury, any, uh, any damage from that mold in there as well. We'll see ataxia gates, we'll see finger to nose, we'll see tremors, we'll see uh, a lot of different, different neurological trauma come up when people have been dealing with, with mold. The HLA-DR is going to be another, another genetic test that is good to tell if someone uh, is going to be more sensitive to mold or not. So then we get into uh, how do we treat that mold patient? Well, again, I, I start with the brain repair kit, and that's, uh, that's because we've got to get that inflammatory cascade down. I've had a lot of patients where uh, I'm treating, working on them from uh, from a distance. They're in a different city, uh, state, anything like that, and that's one of the first things we do. And they start having dramatic changes just by getting the glutathione levels up in the body, uh, getting the the inflammation down, starting to use it topically. A bunch of different different changes will occur when we start using that brain repair kit. So then we have to clean up the living space, and this can be as simple as. Uh, as making a couple couple little changes like uh, some of the other presenters are going to be talking about today and it could be all the way up to eighty thousand dollars and having to tear out lots of things and it just really depends on the person and how bad the space is but for most patients for two three four hundred dollars they can get their HEPA filter they can get their mold solution spray their candles they can uh, do a few things and really get that countdown. If they need more than that, they can uh, call Jeff and get a fogging fogging system, which he's going to speak about and how that's able to knock down the spores, and that can make the difference. If you put out mold uh, plates again and they're still high, then you have to think about: Do we need to tear out the carpet? Do we need to uh, pull out that shower because we know water is getting behind there? And then cut out some of the the two by fours or whatever else is in there. Uh, you know, you just can take it a step by step by step process, and everybody on this on this uh, webinar today is going to be able to help you through that process because it can be overwhelming. I've gone through it. It was it was crazy. We lived in our camper out in the uh, in the property for about two months because we were working on the house. We were getting ready ready to sell. Uh, all the, all those different issues. So neurofeedback, again, this is going to be one of my cornerstones for working with patients with mold issues because they have what we call mold brain, and we need to get that brain back online. We need to find out where those damaged areas are, and we need to train them up. We need to teach the brain to get these other, other areas that have been damaged back online and start regenerating neuronal tissue around that damaged area.
Uh, the Live O2, again, another another tool that, that we'll use with the patients uh, with mold because a lot of them have had lung issues, brain issues. We've got to get that oxygen going better uh, throughout the body, throughout that healing process. So on the, the blood work, again, you can't really tell a whole lot as far as whether someone's having mold issues just off of blood work, but the number one thing that I look at is, you know, it just like Lyme disease or Epstein-Barr or a lot of these other ones, there's no great thing that's going to just come in and kill mold. Yes, you can do cholesteramine and some of these different things, uh, but ultimately we've got to get that body as healthy as possible. We've got to raise up that entire system, fix the blood sugar, fix the adrenals, fix the thyroid, fix any autoimmunity, uh, downregulate that inflammatory immune cascade, all these different things. That is the number one, number one thing that I do when I start thinking about a holistic view is we've got to make that body as healthy as possible. Yes, we need to deal with the house. We need to deal with the, the specific uh, damage in the body, but no matter what it is, maybe they're really stressed, maybe they've got diabetes, maybe they've got leaky gut, whatever else it is, we've got to fix those issues, build them up, and be able to, to make, those, make those changes in there. So uh, that's, that's the big part of where we need to start with treating that mold patient is to uh, figure out what they have, where they have it, how it's affecting their body, are they going to be able to heal, and from there move on to how much is it going to take for them to truly get better as far as how much is it going to take to to get their house better how much is it going to take to get their body better how much is it going to take to get their brain better all those different things uh, we've we've had some some dramatic changes with patients uh, this is is something that my my family has worked with uh, I've had family members that have had mold issues that have had some pretty major issues I have an e4 I know how overwhelming it can be for a patient to go through this pro process and I also know how overwhelming sometimes as a practitioner it can be to look at the big picture and go oh my gosh look at all these different things where do I start and so uh, that's what everybody on this webinar is here to help with how can we uh, get your patient from uh, A to Z get them figuring out where the damage is uh, what's going on and how we can actually help that process and help that patient heal uh, just like that little four-year-old we don't know what ultimately it was that caused the damage to her brain and her nervous system. All we knew was that she was a nine-month-old in a four-year-old body, was never going to be able to go to the bathroom on her own, was never going to be able to eat on her own, uh, never able to live on her own, any of those things. Uh, so we started with, with the basics and we found out where the imbalances were in the brain, where the deficiencies were in the blood work. We looked at, at her neurological testing, we figured out uh, her APOE, uh, we started the treatment, started doing brain training, started giving glutathione, doing the different nutrients that we need, and uh, you, three months in, she's a different kid. You know, that if you looked in her eyes today, looked in her eyes three months ago, there would be no doubt about it that she was a different kid at this point. And that's how every one of our brain injury patients come in, and we're just able to make these dramatic shifts in people's lives that, uh, that really can not just affect them, but then if that pay it forward where it affects everyone else down the road. So uh, we're here to help with this process. If there's any questions at all, feel free to uh, to shoot me a personal message. I'm going to answer any other questions at this point. Uh, and will someone be addressing the effects of any of mycotoxins in foods? Uh, so someone asked a question about uh, mycotoxins in foods and uh, I can I can answer uh, that question quickly here as well so uh, you know some of the big things that we're looking at with the mycotoxins in foods would be um, like the uh, in genetically modified foods we have the glyphosate and the research shows that it damages the gut lining and contributes to leaky gut there there's reports where uh, pigs that are fed non-GMO grains versus pigs that are fed GMO grains, the ones that are fed uh, GMO grains, their gut lining is so perforated, their small intestine, that they can't even make sausage out of it anymore. Very, very much a, a damage to there. So if we're having that damage in our gut lining, it's affecting the inflammation, affecting the blood-brain barrier, and uh, we should be able to see some of those, some of those damages in a, in a brain map as well. So, uh, 
All right. Well, let's go ahead and we'll take a another five minute break. If you guys have any more questions, feel free to shoot those over. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and give you my email address and then my cell phone number as well. My email is b galliart g a l y a r d t at hotmail dot com. I'll go ahead and put these in here as well. And my cell phone number is nine seven zero four two zero. Six two seven seven. Uh, we will be having another Clear Mind seminar coming up this fall. Uh, basically, an intro to how to get it into your practice, how to get it up and running. Uh, we do boot camps at my office where doctors and and their technicians can come in, learn the system, learn how to uh, how to incorporate it in on Monday morning. We go over how to review a brain map, how to do a workshop, how to do all these different things. Uh, as well as uh, if you just have general questions, feel free to, to give me a call on any of that. Or if you're having issues with, with maps or any patients, anything along those lines, I'm always, always excited to help people out. So I'm sending over that right now. That just got sent out. Uh, and good. Uh, if you have any other questions, give me a call. Otherwise, we'll go on to Kurt Johnson in about five minutes. Thank you.